A Dead of Fire by J. Alexander Greenwood, a Caroline Street Press publication. Redger slipped the pry bar under the window, testing the strength of the wood. The house was built when Mad King George frittered away the colonies, after all, and Redger could destroy an entire window with a bit of carelessly applied pressure. The wood gave a little. You would think it were soft gum rather than ossified oak. It groaned like a whisper fart in a darkened theater. Cold wind whipped at his face. Sweat ran from his brow into his left eye. It smarted worse than when that stuck-up tart at the green man blew smoke in his face. He stopped working the pry bar and sat back with a grunt, his shoulder slumping against the ornate stone arch around the window. Come to think of it, a cigarette would be good right about now. The wind wouldn't allow it, of course. And never you mind the bit of flesh from my throat the National Health is busy testing. If it's cancer, I've had it coming, Roger told the doctor. Well, no one deserves cancer, the doctor said, glancing up from his chart. If you say so, doc. Yeah... He wants to see how burglar-proof that pile is over on Bali Moor, Fairborn said, leaning back in his creaky chair, his hairy-knuckled hand fiddling with the zipper at the back of his jumper. What's that mean? Am I meant to break in? Fairburn cocked his thumb and forefinger at Redger like a gun, winked and pulled the trigger. Exactly, my son, he said, a hint of Geordie clinging to his vowels. And if I get nicked, he said, leaning forward in the hard chair before Fairburn's cluttered desk. You, Redger the Reliant, nicked? Fairburn made a melodramatic show of being amazed, his hands beseeching the heavens for guidance. And just how many times have you ever been nicked? Redger grinned, exposing crooked yellowing teeth. He looked away and held up two fingers, giving Fairburn a good-natured screw you, mate. Once. That's right, Fairburn said, and that wasn't even your fault. You won't get caught, and if you do, I'll bail you out. Redger didn't believe a word. Fairburn would let him rot in the clink, let him smell the decay of the metal and the resigned sweat of failure a while. Oh yes, and he'd tell the client the house was burglar-proof, all right, pocketing every penny. How much dosh, Reggie said, sitting back, his grin wider, exposing a wider expanse of crooked yellow. He always smiled bigger when he felt on edge. Didn't matter if he was picking a lock or making a pull at the pub, he smiled big when the nerves started to fray. This cheeky bugger makes more cheddar in a year than we'll on a whole miserable lives, and he only wants to pay 500 quid. He raised his bushy eyebrows at Redger. But I'm not going to stand for that kind of exploitation of the working class, mind you. I've got my principles. I got your 600. Redger's face was a rictus of solemnity in contrast to his insides, which roiled with the tense laughter of a man who knows when someone's taking advantage. He offered 1500. Redger's face was porcelain. Fairbairn's eyebrows lowered like two caterpillars riding a leaf in the wind. He inhaled deeply and smiled, revealing gray, crooked teeth that looked like Highgate on a sunny day. He waved Redger's comment away with a meaty hand. Never could put one past you, Reg, he said. His bluster dialed back. Right. He offered 1200 Actually, and after I cut, I'm let you have 750 Eight. You're killing me. Reg rose to his feet. I get nicked, and I'm going to need every penny. Besides, I don't need the aggro. I can't be arsed about for anything less than eight. Wait. All right. All right. Eight, you pirate. He extended a hand. Reg shook it. All right. 200 deposit. Fairbairn pulled open a desk drawer and counted out 220s, handing them to Reger. Break in tonight, he said. Report in the morning. Call in the mobile. He nodded, pocketing the cash. I'll try every doorknob and cat flap. The three-story stone pile was dark and overgrown with vines. Twisted, leafless trees and an iron fence right out of hammer films framed the old man's. Reger eased through a broken section of fence and started to work. No surprise, every door was locked and impenetrable. That left checking the windows. He would climb in the first available window, then check the rest from the inside. None of the first floor windows would budge, so he climbed up the vines of the north turret, grunting with effort and thanking the gods for a moonless night as he scaled the wall to a window. He suspected turret windows would be unlocked. Besides, being highly visible from the road, you'd have to be an expert climber to get to them. He'd made it up the stony vine-covered turret in five minutes and enjoyed a respite on the ledge by the windowsill. The wind whipped his ears through his black balaclava, and he decided that nobody would hear the wood around the window if it cracked. He wasn't spending the night climbing to every window on this old rubbish heap, either. In a deft motion, he jimmied the window up. It groaned and popped upward, snapping off a useless old sash lock. A gust of stale, dusty air escaped past him into the night. Was that suet? Must be a flu somewhere. He looked around, scanning for anything amiss. Seeing nothing, Raja dropped in the window, gently pulling it down behind him. He felt the splintered wood around the broken sash lock. Not too bad. That Ponzi actor can afford to fix it. Redger let his eyes adjust to the darkness. For fear of being seen, he couldn't use his torch until he was in the interior hallway. He felt his way around the turret room, his hands extended like Frankenstein's monster. 
He found the hallway and removed the balaclava. His damp face cooled immediately, but it wasn't as pleasant as he expected. His nostrils were assaulted by the odors of dust, decay, and something he had not smelled in years. It's only a rat, my son. He shook his head as if trying to clear his nostrils. A dead rat? No. This was something else, something atrocious and disgusting. Get a grip. Found his pocket torch and switched it on. Dull gray walls and ornate rich wood wainscoting emerged from the shadows beside an intricately carved landing. He shone the light down the stairs toward the first floor. No need to go there. Those windows are solid. He pointed the light upstairs to the third floor, his next stop after checking the second floor. Redger made quick work of checking the dozen odd second floor windows. No problems. All locked securely. As he rounded the corner of the carved banister and headed up to the third floor, he heard the piteously sad, frightened sobs of a child. How the bloody hell did a nipper get in this house? He was angered, at first out of fear and adrenaline, then out of the realization that if there indeed was a child in the house, he'd have to help get him out. Then Reggie would have to dump him on the road somewhere to fend for himself. No, no, more likely to call the police and tell him where to find the brat. He cursed and switched off the torch, standing still on the stairs. The sobs continued. Bloody hell. Redger turned around, one hand on the banister. He legged it two steps at a time deck downstairs. I'll call the police from a phone box after I get out. I'm not getting banged up for this. The sobs grew louder, the inconsolable wail of an injured child, terrified and alone. Redger covered his ears with his gloved hands. The bombed out village jetted from the earth and charred pieces like a vandalized burned movie set. Artillery had leveled almost every structure save the three-story turret of a church. The house of worship stood sentinel over the rest of the ruins. The surrounding homes were mere piles of block and sticks, bricks and thatch. Redger and his patrol fanned out, keeping an eye open for snipers and stragglers. We expected anything, a corporal asked. The sergeant shook his head. Redger grasped his machine gun with white knuckles as he stepped carefully through the rubble. Hey, Reg, didn't your old unit work this sector before you hooked up with us? Redger nodded quickly, looking away from Corporal Martins. What's that smell? The corporal said. Shut it, Martins, the sergeant said, holding a hand up, indicating that the patrol was to stop. An oily, acrid blend of odors wafted past. Redger found it reminiscent of charcoal pork and beef on a mixed grill. The meaty stench combined with the musky sweetness he couldn't peg. Cool, Martin said, making a gagging noise. I'm gonna call. Redger, his own gag reflex activating, pulled a dirty rag he used to clean his weapon from his pack and tied it around his nose and mouth. The pungent gun oil didn't help much. The sergeant pointed to a plume of black smoke a few blocks away. He signaled the men to follow. Redger took his hands from his ears. The sobbing quit. He breathed in and out a moment. The ripe smell had vanished with the sobs. He mentally leaped over a thought about a haphazard grip on sanity. He turned and worked his way back up the stairs and switched on his torch as he made the third floor landing. It revealed a smaller hallway and five doors, all shut. He checked the doorknobs. Two opened, revealing empty rooms with locked doors. Another door led to a bathroom. One door was locked. I'll just pass on that one. The final door appeared closed as he approached. Two steps before he reached it, it fell open slowly as if someone were warily inviting him in. Hello, he said, startled by the sound of his own chalky voice. His skin crawled with goose flesh. Nothing, just an open door. He shone the torch in. A pile of burning logs some 15 feet high dominated the ruined town square. The smell was rank and easily permeated Redger's gun rag mask. Crease out? They burning railroad ties? Martins asked. Can't see shit, we're downwind. Redger could make out a man in civilian clothes standing beside the fire, his face a mask of soot. Beside him stood a small boy, perhaps eight years old. The boy's face was all ashy filth, with thin tracks of tears on his cheeks and gobs of yellow snot clotting his nose. The sergeant approached the man and child, with Martins and Redger keeping a sharp eye. What you doing? The sergeant asked the man. The child wailed. Redger wanted to comfort the boy, perhaps offer him a chocolate bar, but the smell of the burning put him off chocolate, and he doubted it would stifle his tears. He scanned the perimeter, seeing no one and no telltale glints of steel or glass indicating snipers. The man turned to the sergeant. What? His voice a leathery whisper. Oi, why are you burning these logs? The sergeant asked, blanching from the heat and smell. The wind shifted, sending the smoke another direction. Redger wiped a clean handkerchief across his stinging eyes, then looked again. Blinking, he saw the sergeant gesturing at the civilian. I said, why are you burning logs? The civilian looked at the pyre. The child continued to wail. Redger felt a familiar pain behind his eyes. He looked away from the child, his eyes on the sergeant. The sergeant glanced back at the fire, stopped talking, and dropped his weapon. 
Sergeant? Roger called, raising his machine gun to his chest. Christ, Martin said, his voice just above a whisper, pointing at the stacks of burning logs. He dropped to one knee and vomited. Reggie peered closer at the fire. The logs were stacked haphazardly, like a pile of sticks a girl guide might try to arrange into a campfire. Reggie looked at the ground. Hello? I, I won't hurt you, he said. Unlike the others, this room was furnished. A child's room, complete with small bed, brightly painted walls, baby blue curtains, and an assortment of toys littering the floor. Redger crept in, shining the torch around the circular space. Are you here? Stop crying now, sweetheart. I'm here to help. Redger's torchlight fell upon a large, rocking hobby horse in the center of the room. Though it remained still on a hooked rug, it somehow conveyed a sense of motion. Redger reached out to touch it, and the door slammed behind him. The crying stopped. The logs have faces. The burning logs stared at the men, eyes hollow, mouths gaping in a silent plea. Oh no, Martins mumbled, oh no, oh no. The child's cries turned to screams. Could somebody get that child to shut his gob? Roger felt like a madman was swinging an axe in his skull. The smell of charred human flesh infiltrated his lungs. His last crap meal of rations climbed up his throat. Roger turned his head, bowed at the waist and vomited, trying not to lose sight of the sergeant, the man and the child as he retched. Who are these people? The sergeant demanded. Who did this? The civilian turned back to him. You people burned us alive. He pointed a bony finger at each member of the squad one by one. You people. No, I mate, the sergeant said. We don't do that. The child shrieked like a feral beast and ran at the sergeant, beating his hands against the soldier's belly. The sergeant fended him off and picked up his weapon. That's enough, sonny. He turned to his men and yelled, Martins, Regia, get over here. The men moved closer. Sir, Martin said, training his guns on the old man and child. Just keep your eyes open, the sergeant said, turning back to the old man. What happened here? We were chopping wood when we heard the guns, the old man said, his voice monotone, numb. The child shrieked again and ran into the ruins as if to escape the old man's words. The old man ignored him. We watched from the hill as soldiers, men dressed like you, pulled everyone out of what was left of their homes. Everyone. The leader shouted about snipers killing his men. He demanded we give up our sniper or he would kill us all. The sergeant looked back at Reger, then back at the old man. Go on. We had no snipers. Just women, children, and old men. Our soldiers are at the front. The one of your soldiers started shooting. The leader ordered his men to set fire to the bodies. Even then, no one would admit to being a sniper. The leader went into a rage. He started throwing people on the fire alive. Said he would not waste another bullet. Everyone would burn alive. Good God, Martin said. All we could do was watch as they burn my daughter, his mother, he said, gesturing toward the ruins where the boy had run. My wife, they burned them all. He was emotionless as if reciting a meaningless poem from his school days. The sergeant looked back at Reger and Martin's. Martin's shoulders sagged. Involuntarily, Reggie smiled his ridiculous, sickly grimace. They killed everyone and left town. His eyes fell on the pyre. Left us this. I assure you, we didn't do this. My eyes do not deceive me. No. You tell me what the uniforms look like. The sergeant poked his gun barrel at the old man's chest. A geyser of blood erupted from the sergeant's neck, spraying the old man's blackened face with crimson. The crack of a rifle came a millisecond after, as if to acknowledge that the soldier had indeed been shot. Sniper! Martin said, searching the horizon and dropping to one knee. Reger watched the sergeant's bloody face. In two seconds it registered surprise, anger, and lifeless resignation. He fell forward into the flames. The old man watched him burn, his face impassive. Martins ran toward the sergeant, spraying the church turret window with bullets. Reger whirled and ran at the turret. Reaching it, he flattened himself against the wall, looking for an entry. Martins, get over! Another crack from a rifle interrupted Martin's shots. A red hole formed below his left eye. Martin's finger reflexively squeezed the trigger, emptying his clip in the shape of a halo into the wall just above Reger's head. Bloody! Reger said, ducking as Martins fell, lifeless into the fire beside the sergeant. Reger cursed and flattened himself against the turret wall, creeping around it until he found the door. He glanced back at the old man. The geezer just stood there, watching the sergeant and Martin's burn. A ghastly, crooked smile reclaimed his face. 
Redger burst in the church door and dropped his backpack. It was dark, save for numerous shafts of daylight that shone in through bullet holes. In another reality, the light would have been gorgeous, like Christmas. His reserves of caution exhausted, adrenaline and the lust for revenge propelled him up the stairs, two at a time. He waited outside a cracked wooden door, listening over his ragged breaths. Cursing, he kicked in the door. The child sat on a rocking horse by the window, cradling a rifle that was as long as he was tall. His eyes were wet, his face defiant. He pointed the rifle at Redger. Redger fired. The bullets worked the boy like a puppet, giving him the appearance of riding the horse until Redger stopped firing. In the haze of gun smoke, the boy slumped to the floor, the rifle at his side like a sick game of cowboys and Indians. Redger stepped over him and peered out the window. The old man had not moved from beside the pyre. Redger's eyes stung with tears, his breath coming in gasps as he carried the boy's lifeless body back to the old man. Oh, I'm sorry, he said, almost like a question. He gently laid the boy's body at the old man's feet. He stepped back, casting his eyes about for signs of another sniper he knew was not there. The old man stooped and picked up the child. Wordlessly, he walked into the fire and lay down. Redger moved to stop him, screaming. The flames consumed them as if they had been soaked in kerosene. Redger screamed until his throat bled. When he could scream no longer, he went back inside to recover his pack. He slid it over his shoulder and staggered to the church door, the crackle and pop of the nauseating fire outside, the only sound. He leaned against the door jamb, his hands shaking, eyes blurry. A creaking sound from upstairs broke the relative quiet. He dropped his pack and walked up the stairs to the room where he killed the child sniper. Weapon raised, he stood outside the door attempting to speak with his ragged voice. I won't hurt you, he rasped. The creaking continued. Too tired to wait any longer, Redger rolled into the room, coming up on one knee, his gun poised to fire. There was no one there, only the bullet-ridden horse rocking slowly by itself. Redger picked it up and threw it out the window, breaking the toy horse's back on the rubble below. The greasy stench of the fire coated his nose, mouth, and tongue as he buried his fellow soldiers in shallow graves. He marked the spot on his map and donned his pack. Redger walked a few meters toward the road and stopped. He looked over his shoulder a moment. His peculiar grimace returned. He walked back to the church, picked up the broken rocking horse, and hurled it into the fire. Redger twitched and jerked as if awakened from a deep sleep as he stood in the child's room of the manor. A creak broke the silence. The riderless rocking horse nodded back and forth, back and forth. Redger fought the impulse to run. He didn't bother trying the door. I've had this coming, ain't I? Redger pulled his lighter from his pocket and flicked it until a flame appeared. He touched it to the dusty bedding and curtains. It... it wasn't my fault. It got out of control. A child's cries echoed around the room, turning to laughter. I'm... I'm sorry, he said as he lay down on the child's bed. Fire engulfed the room. The smell of burning meat clogged Redger's senses. Through the haze of smoke and fire, Redger watched the little boy gleefully ride the rocking horse. He watched until he could see no more. This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen, out of character to assure you that the War of the Worlds has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. The Mercury Theater's own radio version of dressing up in a sheet and jumping out of a bush and saying boo. Starting now, we couldn't soap all your windows and steal all your garden gates by tomorrow night, so we did the best next thing. We annihilated the world before your very ears and utterly destroyed the CBS. You will be relieved, I hope, to learn that we didn't mean it and that both institutions are still open for business. So goodbye, everybody, and remember, please, for the next day or so, the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian, it's Halloween. <laughs> <laughs>